Hey, uh, bonjour, hello everyone. My name is Tammy Williams and it is my pleasure as president of Domator to welcome you to the 17th International Domator Conference. For those of you who are new, Domator is the International Society for the Study of Early Cinema. We would have loved to have met with you at the Library of Congress in Culpeper. Um, this is particularly true as this year, 2022, marks the 110th anniversary of motion picture copyright granted in 1912. These first laws gave way to the Library of Congress paper prints, the crown jewel of the world's largest collection of film, which led to more than 6,000 titles, film rolls, fragments, and frames from the cinema's first decades to be registered and saved. While that was not possible this year, uh, we are thrilled to be able to hold this second literally international, literally international conference online, along with not only one, but two online screening programs. Uh, this week, we bring together 40 participants from more than 16 countries and dozens of cities from Montreal, Sydney, and Sao Paulo to London, Paris, and Stockholm to Rome, St. Petersburg, and Istanbul. And we are proud to host over 100 registered guests for four days of live discussions across more than six time zones uh, or more. And uh, once again, all without jet lag. We are truly excited about this year's theme, copyrights and early cinema. That's copy slash rights with an emphasis on the slash. Uh, this conference brings attention to a panoply of understudied sites and practices. It raises questions not only around copyright, but also copies in an economy of reproduction. And particularly in our current moment, it raises questions about rights. Who had the right to copy, to own, to copy or circulate? the creative, intellectual, and material objects we study? And what does this research tell us about social rights and citizenry today? This conference not only expands our views of these questions geographically from Asia, Australia, and Latin America to Africa and the Middle East, but it also adds complexity looking beyond the film print and its proliferation through reproductions and remakes to the diverse geopolitical and socioeconomic contexts in which rights are granted or denied. This year's presenters explore questions of production, privation, patents, and piracy from legal, economic, social, and aesthetic perspectives. And they do so in the work of queer artists, women-owned studios, as well as indigenous and colonial contexts from intertribal home movies and Indian, Turkish, and Filipino colonial films to early Brazilian and Tunisian creative productions. Knitting together questions of regulation and agency with the rights of ownership, reproduction, and circulation, the 2022 conference theme links the work of unacknowledged creators, of writers, performers, camera operators, exhibitors, and censorship editors to those of early archivists and historians, allowing us to weave a rich history of copyrights, copies, and social rights with the techniques and practices required for the preservation and viewing of these objects today. This year's focus on copyrights and early cinema has also allowed us to expand Domator's own links with in its partnership with new archives. Um, in this spirit, I want to, or sorry, in its new partnerships with archives. Um, in this spirit, I want to express my deep gratitude to our fabulous new archival partner at the library, partners at the Library of Congress, National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper for their support. I particularly want to thank David Pierce, Mike Machan, and Lenan Schweighofer at the Library of Congress for providing rare and unseen digitized films and fragments now online. I also want to give my warm thanks to our ongoing partners like the, uh, sorry, the marvelous uh, Emily Coquille and Wafa Germani 
at the Cinémathèque Française, and Michelle Facey and Todd Higginson at Kennington Bioscope, who are streaming both of these film programs. On the Kennington Bioscope site, which you can access, you can access that link through our conference site. Um, please check out You Don't Own Me, Copyrights and Early, uh, sorry, Copyrights and Cinema's First Nasty Women, courtesy of Brett Wood at Kino Lorber, from the DVD set curated by Laura Horak, Ellie Frongen, and uh, this particular program, You Don't Own Me, um, carefully curated uh, for our own for our own conference, for our own Domitor conference by our own magnificent Maggie Hennefeld. Um, on the Cinémathèque Française Henri platform, uh, spelled H-E-N-R-I, Henry, uh, you can now see our, our, you can also now see our screening program, Library of Congress, Copyrights, Copyright Comedies and More, uh, both of which launched yesterday, June 8th, and which will run through uh, the end of the month, that's uh, June 8th, uh, sorry, June 26th for the You Don't Own Me program and July 6th uh, for the Library of Congress program. Uh, this pro these programs feature rare and unseen silence. Uh, this latter program features films and fragments from 1891 to 1917. And these were uh, fragments and prints, uh, sorry, digitized uh, films that were provided to us by the Library of Congress. So soon members will get a chance to see even more of these uh, long uh, unseen and newly visible uh, paper prints on our website. So be sure to renew your dormitory membership because those will be available on the member side. Um, and they're really just such a, a treat for us to be able to see these. And, uh, this is what we're here for. So um, this is why we all we're all we're all here. here. So um, I also want to express my deep gratitude to the Domitor Executive Committee for their enduring uh, for their enduring support, and particularly to our secretaire uh, extraordinaire uh, Clara Eau Claire for her unwavering assistance with communications and translations, and to Demetrios Latsis, our treasurer, for helping to manage our budget. Special thanks also to our coordinating assistant Hugo Lungback, who has been an instrument who has been instrumental in bringing this and several of our conferences to fruition, and you probably all know him well. Um, uh, from the gathering of proposals to the organization of our 10 remarkable panels. Um, most warmly, I want to thank my four fellow members of the Programming and Screening Committee for their phenomenal work. Uh, firstly, Mart Martin Johnson from UNC, who just joined us this past year and who hopped right into the driver's seat, full speed ahead, uh, to Ian Christie from Burbeck College in London, who, sh who has uh, all, who has who helped get the project off the ground? Um, always sharing his brilliant insights on on copyright um, in this case, and Maggie Hennefeld from uh, University of Minnesota, who helped us put rights to the fore in this proposal, and who led us in shaping a, a long list of 120 digitized film prints that we were granted to pre-screen um, into a poignant film program. Last but not least, I want to express my deepest gratitude to Colin Williamson of Rutgers University, who has served us for, I believe, uh, close to eight years now, and who sadly will be leaving us um, after this conference. For this conference, Colin, for, and many years now, Colin has gone above and beyond, not only on the conference committees, but also uh, with managing IT for our website, which you can all um, enjoy. He's played a crucial role in coordinating many different aspects of this second virtual conference and of the various pages that you see on our website. So uh, it's been a team effort and I just want to thank you all uh, for coming. And uh, before I think, turn things over to Martin, I want to invite you all to attend our general assembly uh, on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time and 8 p.m. European time. Uh, it'll be a brief General Assembly run by Clara. I'll be on the airplane heading to Europe uh, for a Dulac retrospective in Paris, um, but I will be 
coming in too. And we will be uh, celebrating with a virtual cocktail. So have your cocktails ready for Saturday at 1, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and now a few words from Martin who will launch our first panel. Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, again, thank you, Tammy, for all your work, both in the lead up to this conference and over the past decade on the behalf of Domator. I think we all appreciate it uh, more than you know. Uh, one small uh, late addition to our program for today, um, David Pierce of the Library of Congress will be giving a paper during the second panel titled Copyright in the Library of Congress. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to just say a bit about how the conference will be run. So first, uh, we're using the Zoom webinar format, which I imagine some of many of you are familiar with. Uh, which means that you will see panelists on the screen, but not attendees. For those who are presenting, make sure that you're signed into the webinar in advance of your panel, and I will promote you to panelists. Attendees can ask questions using the Q&A feature, which will be either answered live on video or via text in the Q&A. If time permits, we'll also allow for spoken questions, which you can request using the Q&A feature. And Claire O'Claire will provide English translation for the first panel on Sunday. Uh, we've asked presenters to keep their papers to 15 minutes. I will keep track of the clock and let panelists know when they've reached their allotted time. In addition, the panels are being recorded and will be made available later. Uh, we will be using the same link for all four days of the conference, including the General Assembly, as Tammy discussed, which will take place on Saturday, June 11th. For the General Assembly, we'll all become panelists and share what I hope to be a rich conversation about the future of Domator. And out of respect to presenters, I will keep us on schedule, which includes short breaks between panels. This includes right now, so we'll begin our first panel at 15 past the hour, which is in four minutes. Uh, thank you and welcome again to Domator 2022, Copyrights in Early Cinema. And wait, so let me get... I'll pause the recording. So welcome to our first panel, uh, which is titled Early Copyright in an International Context. I'll be chairing this first panel. I'm going to introduce each panelist before they begin their presentation, which will give them time to set up. So we'll start with Ian Christie, who is a film and media historian, a professor at Burbank College, University of London, and a fellow of the British Academy. He is former president of Europa Cinemas and a one-time video publisher. He has had a long time, long-standing interest in the, the varieties of national definition of film. He's currently joint president of Domator, and his paper is titled Product, Artwork, or Performance, Identifying Films in Law in the Early 20th Century. So with that, I'll turn things over to Ian. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'm very conscious that uh, the mere mention of copyright can have a daunting or a dampening effect on many listeners. <laughs> Which of us has not suffered from being forced to clear copyright in relation to something we've written or are trying to publish? I'm also conscious of being the first speaker in this conference devoted to copy rights and inevitably copy wrongs, which was the title that I used some years ago for what proved to be a, a very lively British Academy event. This is an inherently contentious field. It was in the beginning of the last century, and it still is. Let me begin here by um, offering two examples, uh, both from before 1910 which really take us, I think, to the heart of the issue as far as early film is concerned. One is, that's just to uh, picture the perplexity that we might be, <laughs> we might be suffering in the course of uh, these days of the conference. The first example I want to give is the famous Mummingbirds case. Um, the Mummingbirds was a, a sketch by Fred Carno. There's a new biography of Fred Carno, which you can see there on the right, which I've just reviewed actually for the Times Literary Supplement. And uh, so I'm very conscious of the importance of this extraordinary sketch, which ran for decades under Fred Carno's um, uh, various companies. And Charlie Chaplin made his name in it, of course, as the, the drunken swell. Um, Carno claimed that the Pathé film um, the, uh, at the music hall infringed his copyright on this sketch, which he had registered in 1906. After the court visited the music hall to actually see the sketch and saw the film, the judge found that the film was indeed a representation of the plaintiff's sketch, but that this sketch didn't qualify as a dramatic or musical performance essentially because it had no textual basis. So Carno's case was dismissed, much to his uh, chagrin. 
The um, other example, which is another equally famous one, I'm sure many of you know this, is the famous case of Harper Brothers, Harper's the publishers, that is, versus Kalem, the early film company. This arose from Kalem's uh, unauthorized filming of Lou Wallace's um, blockbuster uh, literary work, Ben-Hur, which was already a popular stage and even arena uh, entertainment. You can see some pictures there of it being staged in the arena uh, from the early years of the last century. The issue there was, um, could this filming be considered an adaptation of a literary work? Was it a dramatization? This went all the way up through the American court system and in an eventual Supreme Court ruling delivered by Justice Holmes, Calum's screen version was judged to infringe Harper's copyright, thus establishing the rights of the owners of the source work of a film. So after such apparently contradictory rulings, albeit under different jurisdictions, different categories of work, the Berlin Act of 1908 amended the previous Berne Convention to include reference to film for the very first time. America, however, did not enter the Berne framework until many decades later. So let me turn to a second case uh, by way of illustrating the dilemma as it is still with us today. And this turns on the status of those founding works of early cinema, the Lumiere films. According to the UNESCO Memory of the World Register, the Lumiere films are protected by artistic copyright law. Pecuniary rights are owned until 2039 by the Association Frère Lumiere, while non-pecuniary rights are held by the Lumiere estate. Now, under French law, there are both proprietary rights and moral rights. The former can expire and can be assigned to other parties, the latter moral rights cannot. They're inalienable, eternal, and inviolable. And, by the way, there are five different forms of moral right, which uh, we won't pursue here in the interest of time. But wait, a DVD of the Lumiere films was published in America in the 1990s with a commentary by the president of the Association Frère Lumiere, Bertrand Tavernier. How come? Well, under US law, all works published before 1923 are in the public domain. So as a result of this, the Lumiere corpus of films, I would suggest, remains relatively little known beyond the central films that everyone knows. And in a sense, it could be described as a deliberate cutting off of one's nose despite one's face, uh, because having protected the Lumiere films for uh, well over a hundred years, they really aren't as well known as they should be. Is protection always a good thing? I'm not going to go further down these rabbit holes here, but what I want to explore very briefly here is the indisputable fact that the appearance of animated photography posed acute problems for those seeking to protect their creative work in this new field, and for those, of course, seeking to exploit it. But we could also say that the existing framework for copyright was already in need of updating when film came along in the 1890s, with both photography and sound recording already having posed similar problems. But in the case of film, there was a new urgency, given how widely popular it was, how easy it circulated between countries with different legal philosophies and frameworks, and the fact that it relied on new technological processes. The dilemma was well summarized as early as 1897, which is only the second year of public film screenings, in an English entertainment trade paper, The Era. The film, let me pass on, give you a quote, that, that is indeed the British Museum, and this arose because Robert Paul, the English pioneer, had offered the British Museum in uh, 1897 the possibility of um, preserving some films as part of its historic collections. He got no answer from the British Museum. The era ran the following observation. The film was neither a print nor a book, nor in fact, everybody could say what it was not, but nobody could say what it was. Nobody could say to which particular pigeonhole it belonged. That was a shrewd observation and it continued to be true. 
for a very long time. Product, artwork, or performance. Most films were already potentially all three, and each of these was covered by different terms of legislation, which were also different in at least three important jurisdictions, important for these early years, France, Britain, and the United States. Legally, film was a, an anomalous, complex object, and as it was inherently likely to travel, it could be subject to these different legislations. Result? much confusion. Trying to secure copyright for film, of course, began early. In the US, it began with Edison, following the recognized American route of deposit at the Library of Congress, applied to all publications, with, first of all, with Fred Ott's sneeze, and continuing with the paper records of early films, which would, as Tammy has already remarked, which would form the Library of Congress's paper print collection. In Britain, a single frame was considered sufficient. And so, starting with Robert Paul registering a sea cave near Lisbon, which you see here, in 1897, a collection of these frames was deposited at Stationers Hall to claim copyright on the work in question. And this was before, in the case of Britain, the extension of copyright to include film by the 1911 Copyright Act. Some years ago, I tried to identify four distinguishable aspects of the challenge that film offered. And I'm going to give you this list because it, it may come in useful as we wend our way through this, this tangled uh, territory. First, there is the question of patent and trademark law, as this affected both equipment manufacturers and film producers, which of course were often initially different branches of the same company. Secondly, terms of trade in the early film business. And by this, I mean um, things such as sale of prints, which was the pattern for the first 10 or 15 years of cinema, versus hire, which became the pattern thereafter. This, these terms had to be squared with prevailing commercial norms in different countries. Thirdly, we might say copyright in the broadly in the sense that we understand this today, applied to films considered as creative works with commercial value. Fourthly, I would say, issues of authorship. Given that films involved multiple creative inputs, an issue that is, of course, still very much with us and which continues to divide, essentially, French from Anglo-American approaches, something which was recognized by the European Union Copyright Term Directive back in 2006. I think that uh, breakdown that I've offered you still stands as a, a summary of the distinguishable and yet often overlapping rights that are at stake in audiovisual works. And of course, there are more too, but I suggest these four um, are perhaps the primary ones. But it's important to stress that this is a, this is a dynamic field and it's an ongoing field with the added complication that it's subject to retroactive rulings. So a work can be free of rights at one time, but can then fall under restriction or ownership by new legislation, as has happened quite often when books have come back into copyright due to term extension. The past of film, to paraphrase Faulkner, is certainly being reanimated, but is also being invested with new rights and restrictions which often seem to run counter to the affordances of the digital world. You may recognize a, a still from Woody Allen's uh, Midnight in Paris. Believe it or not, the Faulkner estate sued Disney for a minor misquotation of Faulkner's phrase, the past is never dead. <laughs> I don't think the suit ever came to trial. <laughs> Let me summarize what I think are the main current problems for scholarship and for practical work with early film, which I think concerns us as, as scholars of early film. First of all, the accumulation of more than one kind of right around a single information product. And this is what the EU term directive tried to deal with. And I quote from it here, what may appear to the uninitiated user as a single product may in fact be protected by multiple layers of overlapping rights each with its own term of protection, potentially calculated according to disparate rules. In other words, it's, it's quite a mess <laughs> and it's different from every national perspective. Secondly, there's a growing number of orphan works, 
for which no owner or rights proprietor can be found. Normally, the onus is on a would-be user to diligently search for rights holders, but this is becoming increasingly unrealistic. The number of orphan works is actually growing because of the process of restoration and recovery of early film. It's not diminishing. The processes of searching, of diligently searching, are becoming more um, easier to some extent, but there is no conclusion to this process. Who can say that they have uh, reached a conclusion that in fact it's that there are, there are no rights uh, extant. Thirdly, and this I think is something which I hope will come up in discussion during this conference, and it relates to the orphan works dilemma. There is, I would suggest, uh, an, an IP industry with its own protectionism, which actually threatens the circulation of works. There are many organizations which, if they cannot discover an owner, a rights holder, someone willing to sign a, a license, would rather not take the risk. Why would they rather not take the risk? Because they worry that they will get a letter uh, from an IP um, lawyer forcing them to cease or desist. So we are in a situation, I think, where it's becoming increasingly difficult to deal freely with many works that have little or no real economic value, yet which often cannot circulate freely for educational or scholarly or cultural purposes. I hope it helps to understand the historic roots of the copyright problems that film posed in its very first decade and the changes in intellectual property law that film actually helped to precipitate. It also helps, I think, to understand that there are deep and unresolved philosophical differences between essentially the jurisdictions formed by the Napoleonic civil code and the Anglo-American common law tradition. I think that's the fundamental distinction. But we need to understand that these historic roots are being constantly revised both locally and by supranational bodies such as the World International Property Organization, WIPO, and by commercial corporations which have a vested interest in securing and maintaining proprietary rights. In film, as in many other areas, the past is definitely not past. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks so much. So next we have Zvi S. Rosen, who is an assistant professor at the Southern Illinois University School of Law, where he teaches courses including copyright and real property. He served as the 20, let's see, get this back, as a 2015-2016 Abraham L. Kamenstein Scholar in Residence at the US Copyright Office. He is currently consulting with the Library of Congress on its early copyright records digitization project. And his paper is titled The Legal Context of Copyright in Early Motion Pictures in America. All right. Yep. Great. So I changed the title to From America to the United States, which perhaps will indicate that perhaps I come at this from a somewhat different angle. And this is sort of exciting for me to be talking to a different audience from, from what I usually talk to, which is a bunch of law professors and lawyers. Um, this is gonna be very US focused, but hopefully informative to the group. Um, so the, the big picture of this is that the development of motion pictures occurred concurrently with major shifts of the administration of copyright law in the United States. And this is based on two articles. Neither of them is focused on motion pictures. This really takes the motion picture elements of both. So, Copyright registration in the United States evolved over time in terms of how it was structured. So it started out, you'd register at a local federal court, you would then publish it, you would write notice, which is a little copyright symbol, deposit, send a copy. That would evolve over time to become publishing first, then registering, then depositing. Um, one interesting thing to note is because until 1909, you would register first, then publish. Typically speaking, you would all, the only material that would be given to registrar of copyrights, whoever it, whoever it was, was a printed title page, a title of a work, and a type of media that was being registered. There was not a complete copy of a work being given 
to inform the decision of whether or not to register. And as a subject matter, uh, the last one, of course, many, many of you will hear will know. It started out very as a very small number of books, maps, and charts. Um, in 1802, prints were added. 1831, music, cuts, and engraving were added. In 1865, photographs were officially added. The 1870 Act added a lot of what we might call minor copies, they added chromolithographs, et cetera. And then there wasn't really anything added until 1912 when motion pictures were added. Um, and with a little bit of simplification, but it's largely true that the major additions were much earlier. Some of you may know that sound recordings were not added until much later in 1972. So you have this period with rapid expansion of copyright law, and then there's a long sort of fairly quiet period and then motion pictures were added in 1912, officially. Now, of course, many of you know that motion pictures were actually being registered earlier, and that's part of what we're gonna to discuss today, how that worked. So prior to the early 20th century, there was no examination for copyrightability. Um, in other words, there was no examination in registration for what's not for work was actually protectable by copyright. This makes sense, right? If you're only seeing a title page, how are you gonna know? However, in the late 19th and early 20th century, an application register of work for copyright would be rejected and did not fit into existing categories. So while we didn't check if a work itself was copyrightable, it would be rejected if it was did not fit into an identified category for copyright. The flip side of this is that if a work could be fit into an existing category, however awkwardly, it would be registered. And whether or not something fits is this very ad hoc determination. Very early on, before 1870, there was very little of this. The key thing to know in this era, I know this is pre-motion pictures, but the clerks who were making registration were nepotism appointments. So except for one exception of the patent medicines, they would just register whatever they were given, pretty much. And we see that with music and photographs. So mu for music, it was added in 1831, but you see music being registered for copyright in the, 18, in the 1790s. They just called it a book. Likewise, you see a photograph being registered for copyright well before it officially ended in 1865. You see stereoscopes being entered for copyright in the 1850s. Um, one of my projects was to uh, digitize the um, uh, US District Court in DC's copyright holdings. This is one of Matthew Brady's um, copyright registrations for a Civil War photo. He didn't actually send in the photo. He just sent in this sort of um, cardstock with a inscription on it to this record. And these were being accepted well before 1865. And so when movies come along, the obvious question is going to be, well, how is it going to be handled? In the interim, though, the Library of Congress takes over copyright registration. This was entirely motivated by the desire to build the Library of Congress into a national library. Copyright was a means to an end. It was not an end unto itself for the Librarian of Congress. And this was pushed for very heavily by Isra Spofford, who was served as a librarian from 1865 until 1897. And he actually had been of a library as I believe assistant librarian for four years before that. In practice, uh, under Spofford, copyright registration large, really resembled a practice from 1798 to 1870. It was now centralized in one place. The Library of Congress did put out a pamphlet that, that had rules for registration. I've actually um, put that online. If anyone wants, I can give you a link. Um, but it was it's like a two-page pamphlet. There's very basic instruction um, rules. There's a whole separate history for ads and product labels. I wrote a piece about it. They were in the patent office. It's very, very an exception to all of this. For everything else, um, Andrew Spofford handled registrations in a very, even by the end of his tenure, this was very old fashioned. 
experience has enabled me to classify the various requests that are made here, and I have a blank form printed to me for most of them. There are 37 of these blank forms, and I glance through the letters at my desk, one after the other, I mark them with a blue pencil, a particular mark card with a blank form by which it is to be answered. But of course, the dollars which for applicants for impossible coverage have enclosed have to be sent back to them. This was examination. This was in, this was in April of 1894. Literally, this one guy who was a Lincoln appointee was looking at all the correspondence, writing uh, writing something with a, blue, with a blue pencil on the correspondence, and then one of his assistants would send back a blank form indicating the response and sending back the money if it was not going to be if it was not going to be registered. So, how did this play out? I wanted to focus on this briefly because it's one of the few episodes we have of a work being rejected that we know about. We know there was a lot more, but the records were not kept. In this one, the dancer, the dancer Marie Louise Fuller, better, better known as Lloyd Fuller, attempted to register her serpentine dance. She then sued someone for infringing her dance before registration was made. But this is what Spofford actually said. And this is the response to correspondence by the person Fuller was suing. The entry of a copyright in a serpentine dance was not made. For reasons that does not come with a designation of any articles which are lawful subject to copyright, is saying this is not a dramatic composition and it has to be a dramatic composition to be registered. So this is 1892. In 1894, and I know Claudia is gonna be talking much more about this, um, you have two attempts to register kinetic kinetoscopic records. On the left is the sneeze, which many of us are familiar with, which was, of course, accepted, which is a photo of, I think, 16 frames, um, but presented as a photo. And that was registered as a photo, straightforward. And in this case, they decided, yes, this qualifies as a photograph. We're not going to worry about it's actually 16 photographs. This counts. There's an earlier attempt to register a book or a form. And you see, at least one attempt was denied on August 16th, before it was finally registered on October 6th. So this is not an immediate registration, but instead a somewhat turbulent one. And you can imagine it easily going through this process with Spofford. Copyright registration grew dramatically um, in, during this period. Um, it went from being a couple, 200 per capita to about 1,500 per, per capita from it, from 1870 to 1909, it's a huge increase in copyright output. The Library of Congress can't keep up. Congress creates a position of register of copyrights. Register of copyrights says we need some more automation. They appoint only Thorvald Solberg, who really bought the cop what copyright into the modern era in America. He creates application forms, record keeping, et cetera. Authority to, to do registration to examine was challenged in 1898, but it was denied. Um, the court did indicate there were some concerns under the statute whether the library could, could in fact decide whether or not to register. And the register of copyrights worked for a librarian. Um, but either way, the court ultimately said they would not mandate registration of this work. I'll talk briefly, there's a secret card catalog in the Library of Congress. So I'm gonna run short on time, but some of you have been to this, the largest card catalog in the world. There's a back room, you know, there's the old records. In the back corner, you have this low line card catalog. Then you have some unmarked drawers. One of them is of what was rejected, 1898-1904. You might notice celluloid peeking out of one of the right, which I think might be of interest to this group. When I talk to a copyright, copyright group, they're more, more interested in this, which shows a breakout. But what the one rejected celluloid print was, was by Sigmund Lubin. He tried to register Trip to the Moon, which of course is a George um, Mele picture, the um, philosopher's dream, the astronomer's dream. Um, it was rejected not because he didn't create it. It was rejected because he tried to register it on celluloid film, which was not a permissible medium. When he, when he changed his tactics and just registered, once again, his trip to Mars, 
which were just Vimele's trip to, trip to the moon, they said, no problem. You register as a paper print. We're all good. They probably didn't say it like that, but you get the idea. Um, so it was really all a matter of formalities. You know, the office um, you have this change in copyright, copyright law happened in 1909. It was proposed to add motion pictures to it. The industry ultimately decided that they weren't going to push for it, and there was no push to do it until Caleb E. Harper a few years later. This is kind of cool. This is the actual procedure by which you would register a motion picture or any other photograph with the Copyright Office in 1909. It would go through a series of people. Um, the application would be checked for validity. The fee would be checked. Um, someone would separate regular and irregular applications, which is as which is essentially examination, but it was just checking to see if it was what it said it was. There was no check to see if it infringing with copyright or anything like that. Yeah, the passage of the 1912 Act after Caleb B. Harper that finally officially sets up copyright registration for uh, motion pictures. This is the um, forms that were used for, this is for unpublished. Um, I'll jump through that because we're running out of time. This is photographs 1870, 1909. And you can see, interestingly, that the massive decline in photographs being registered corresponds to 1912 motion pictures, but it actually starts falling before that. And it's interesting to speculate and to note this is happening alongside other changes in photography and the drop and removal of motion pictures from copyright for photographs. While part of this is probably not all of it. And finally, I saw interesting to see the massive rise in motion picture registrations over these hundred years. So thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so next we have Claudia Upton Kemp, who is principal academic in film and faculty member at the Center for Intellectual Property Policy and Management at Bournemouth University. She is the author of The Greatest Films Never Seen, uh, The Film Archive and the Copyright Smokescreen, Amsterdam University Press 2018, and co-editor of A History of Intellectual Property and 50 Objects, published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. Her paper is titled, oh, we can see it's changed, Wonder and Wander, Antworth Rand Spofford, and the Formation of the Paper Print Collection. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you, Martin. Hi, everyone. Um, this has been so great already. Thank you, Svi. Um, thank you to, to the organizers for putting together an event. Uh, that brings together uh, people who want to talk about uh, film and copyright. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, wondering and wondering, and I'm also going to speak about Ainsworth Rand Spofford and the formation of the paper print collection. So uh, Martin has already um, introduced me, but um, in addition to my work uh, in Bournemouth, I am currently on academic research leave at the Library of Congress in DC. Uh, where I have been awarded a Kluge Fellowship for my project looking at the process of copyright registration um, at the time of the emergence of film. And as the title already says, I'm specifically looking at the role of Librarian of Congress Ainsworth Rand Spofford in the formation of what is now known as the paper print collection, uh, motion pictures that were registered for copyright, uh, mostly as photographs. So I'm about two thirds through my fellowship. And although I have already collected some interesting pieces of information, both at the Library of Congress and at the Edison Historic Archive, uh, there are still some fundamental documents um, I need to look at. So this is much more of a work in progress uh, presentation than I originally proposed. So the final outcome of my fellowship is going to be a video essay, which will address two layers of the project. So firstly, the topic of the project centered uh, around this link between film historiography and copyright, but it will also address my experience of doing the research, uh, attempting to write this narrative. Uh, the title of the video essay is going to be The Shadow Line, which is a concept by Joseph Conrad, that I started working with um, um, 
a few years ago when I published this um, co-edited uh, volume called The History of Intellectual Property in 50 Objects. And my own chapter in the book on the paper print is one of those 50 objects, uh, takes the form of sort of a fictional love letter to Ainsworth Rance Buffett. And in it, I tell him that often you don't register the important moments in your life as they happen. And only when you look back, do you see that they were important. So the shadow line is that line that you know you've crossed only after you've crossed it and, and can look back over it. We can now clearly point to a time in which there were no motion pictures and when we can clearly point to a time in which there were. Um, I am interested in the messy bit in between, um, the miscellaneous, and particularly the relatively short time during which producers seemingly determined on their own what physical format their deposits took. The time when these deposits came in as strips, as fragments, and then when you can see that this um, new technology um, is, is uh, in transition, and then the responsiveness of the law but also the time before the story of the evolution of this new technology gets flattened and, and simplified for perhaps a greater narrative function, the narrative that is interested in resolution, uh, the narrative that is interested in firsts. Being first in intellectual property and being first in film history are two very different things. Um, in IP, for instance, you cannot obtain a patent for your new invention if you're not the first. But in the telling of film history or history more broadly, uh, we can be looser, so to speak, with creating more imagined points of origin. And I think that the story of the paper print collection brings all of these strands together. Um, but that is all for later. So what I've done for today is sort of stand still and look back uh, over these few months to see where I'm at. Um, we've heard a mention of him already. Uh, Ainsley Trans Bufford worked at the Library of Congress for a total of 47 years. He was appointed the sixth librarian uh, uh, by President Lincoln, and uh, he went on to serve 10 presidents. Uh, Spofford had this one singular vision, and that was to grow the collection of the Library of Congress into a repository of American culture. Um, he had too small a budget that would allow him to fully fulfill this quest, so he thought of a genius solution, and that was to advocate for the passing of the 1870 Copyright Act, and then to centralize all U.S. copyright activities that were uh, previously dispersed among the Smithsonian Institution and the Patent Office here on the left uh, to the Library of Congress on the right. He also argued that if both legally required best edition copies were mailed to Washington directly, um, instead of having to go through those authors' uh, district courts around the country, the copyright records and the publications to which they're pertained would be stored together. One copy would be for deposit, and like that, you would know the number of copyright publications which could prevent uh, copyrights from being invalidated, and the other copy was for growing the collection. Until 1897, the Congressional Library, as it was known then, was part of this building. So Spofford worked here on a daily basis. And since he was a master of making connections, he, he had access to the necessary people to help him in pursuing that idea. So as a result, the collection grew explosively. And so very soon he had, as he so beautifully termed it, a want of room and a want of hands. I will expand on this in much more detail in the final project outcome, but the want for room um, eventually led to the construction of and the move to the Jefferson building in 1897. And the want for hands, we've already heard, eventually led to an expansion of his team that would culminate in the establishment of the Copyright Office and the appointment of the first Register of Copyright, also in 1897, a job that Spofford had fulfilled all along his librarianship. And for someone who had such a foundational role in the development of the Library of Congress, he's actually quite um, under research. The time frame in which all of this takes place is uh, crucial in the emergence of film. And when I first came across Spofford, I, I was astonished that I had never heard of him. 
and that his name is virtually absent from all film literature. So I'm researching the copyright correspondence around this time frame, and uh, uh, based on my research, the, the picture that's starting to emerge is that he, and, and particularly also uh, Solberg as his successor, had a pivotal role in the, the so-called legal conceptualization of film. Uh, Spofford personally signs off on all copyright registrations. He's extremely pragmatic. Um, and uh, the decisions he takes on what does and does not get registered are often based on uh, sometimes quite lengthy exchanges with whoever is trying to register their creative work. Um, but what's also starting to emerge is that the story of this early period in US film history is inextricably linked to both the history of intellectual property and the institutional history of the Library of Congress. And that connection is not as arbitrary um, as it has sometimes been uh, portrayed. So we've heard it already. Uh, part of my project is specifically looking at the first five deposits of what we now know to be motion pictures. All five were produced at Edison's. They come into the Library of Congress between mid 1893 and late 1894. And they are all five initially registered by W.K.L. Dixon. These five represent an interesting sort of separate group of work as there's quite substantive uh, a gap after these from late 1894 till uh, late 1896 during which no registrations for motion pictures by anyone come in. The story uh, might be well known to you. Out of these first five, we only know of three what they were. And this scenario is fascinating to me, both in light of IP, uh, in light of film history, and in light of archiving. Uh, trying to reconstruct the story of what happened is not easy. And if this is the history of the victors and we can tell it only partially, um, then I wonder where does that leave everybody else? Uh, intellectual property is a man-made construction, so is archiving. There are rules and there are people taking decisions about how to interpret those rules. And I'm interested in bringing back into the story some of these uh, decision-making, some of these cultural practices. I've been thinking of an analogy for my experience so far, and uh, the one I'm currently working with is the maze. Um, I've thought of a puzzle, but a, a puzzle mainly confronts me with um, uh, the false promise that I'm working towards uh, some form of completeness. Uh, a labyrinth generally um, contains only one path through, but mazes tend to have multiple paths intricately linked uh, presenting me as a researcher with choices uh, and the potential for getting uh, very lost. So the Dutch word for maze translates into something like uh, a courtyard of wonder. So on one level, I see the maze as an analogy for me, quite literally wandering through uh, the Library of Congress, that the physicality of it. Not only does the library consist of many buildings, some of which are connected through an intricate network of tunnels, uh, there are also many different reading rooms with different cultures and local cultural practices that take real navigation skills uh, to master. Um, there are finding aids and there are finding aids to those finding aids and it takes a while to get a feeling for what sits where. And to get a real sense of place, I'm trying to follow these de deposits from one building to another. So in 1893 and four, they come into the Capitol. They then move to uh, the Jefferson building in 97 and then to the Adams building in 1939. And in that process, they get back on the radar of the staff at the US Copyright Office. And tracing that physicality really helps me in uh, imagining the story. And of course, on another level, um, I see the maze as an analogy for doing history based on primary source material more broadly, the, the journey. The actual material in the archive and the questions it prompts is the starting point. And you follow a path, you take turns, you go down roads that don't necessarily lead anywhere, you get stuck. Um, you look at some of the older materials again, and then you become unstuck by taking another path. 
So for example, the question I started off with was where is the stuff that I know that should be here? So I started looking at Spofford's uh, copyright correspondence in one of the reading rooms, but there I didn't recognize any of the names. So I talked to um, as many people as I could and in wandering the halls, I saw uh, the wonderful exhibition um, at the US Copyright Office and I saw the sneeze on the wall. But you can also immediately tell that that's a facsimile. So I started wondering where is that original material, which in turn led to yet another reading room. Uh, one half of this deposit sits in one reading room and the other half in um, another. And when you follow the question of where is the stuff that I know that should be here, you also invariably need to ask yourself, well, if I can't easily find that stuff, what is all this stuff that is here? And who are all these people? It is such an overwhelming feeling to be faced with the letters of all these people who are trying to copyright all sorts of things. The number of the months, uh, the puzzles they've invented, cures for baldness, and even the designs for um, their toilet paper. So of course, I have to flag up in wandering through my maze that um, really smart people have gone before where I am trying to go. So uh, footnotes in other people's work um, are passed through the maze in their own right. And on many occasions, I've been able to get to a piece of information because someone else's work confirmed that it existed. And then it became my quest to refine it just to get to know their processes because it never sits anymore where they say, uh, where they said it, it, it sat. So John Cole's work on Spofford, uh, Pat Lofney's uh, PhD thesis on the paper print collection, uh, the late Paul Spears early 90s research archive uh, as a prep for an exhibition on the centenary of film, and Bucky Grimm's uh, 1999 film history journal article on the paper print collection have all been um, indispensable uh, sources. Following other people's work also highlights the archaeology of technology in doing this research. So uh, an analog uh, contact sheet of pictures that Paul Spear took at the Edison archive became uh, a digital copy on my sort of crazy good telephone camera uh, that I could zoom in on and ponder over so that I could do a, a sweeping search through an entire digitized publication that wasn't available to him yet so that, so that I could come across uh, a magical photo credit or two as you uh, see here. C.S. Lewis has uh, famously said that what you see depends on where you're standing. And so the writing of the story um, becomes um, a sort of narrativization of the path through. And the maze offers this idea that there is always a story to tell, that there is always a way through. Whether that's a path that leads to narrative resolution is a different matter, uh, but there is a story to tell, and that's necessarily partial, provisional, and told from the present. So what do I see from where I'm standing? That's, that's what I've been wondering. So I see archival presences, but I also see the fragmentary state of the archive and I see archival absences. Um, but it's predominantly the historiography of the story that has become visible. The way in which we have been able to tell the story has changed. And I realize that what I am looking for, where I am looking for it, and how I am looking for it have all changed. So these copyright deposits have come in as records that had a certain purpose, they needed to prove potential infringement. But when these records over time become collections, we tend to lose their sense of purpose and they become products of their own. Um, as records, there is a clear first and as a collection, there's an imagined point of origin. The sneeze, the record tells a different story than the sneeze, the film. The record is from 1894 and the film is from the mid 1950s. Um, the film got assigned value as the first motion picture registered for copyright that survives. It got shown at the Academy Awards in 1958, 
and the subsequent narrative of this collection is so prevalent that it's almost impossible to reconstruct the history of its underlying record. So the shadow line then becomes about more than just a line between a time in which motion pictures did and did not exist. The shadow line also demarcates the transition of these deposits from record to collection within the Library of Congress and perhaps the impossibility of going back over that line. So my research project is a story about innovation, about exclusive control over physical objects and expired rights, and about institutional layers of bureaucracy. But it's also a project about how we tell history about being lost. Um, uh, but it's mainly about people, people and their cultural practices who make far reaching decisions in the way we can tell the story of film. And so to conclude, what has occurred to me on a very personal level in this process of standing still is that I have come the long way around the barn, so to speak, to realize that many years later, I'm essentially still working on my PhD in which I say that the human agency of archivists is a, a neglected component in the debates on archives as sites of history construction and in the debates on archival access. In turn, I could not have done this work without the help of many, many people. There are too many to name here and I could easily have filled my time slot just by thanking them. I will make sure that the credits to my video essay will list them all. And once that work is available, I will share it with uh, the members of this community. Thank you for your attention. Terrific, thanks so much. Um, so last we have Lance Lomax, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of English at Texas Tech University. His research primarily focuses on Japanese film and media history and its place within the political, economic, traumatic, and transnational context of East Asia. His work has appeared in the Journal of Film and Video, and his paper is titled Conflicting Voices, Copyright, Censorship, and Audience in Japan's Early Motion Picture Industry. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as was mentioned, uh, so conflicting voices, copyright censorship, and audience in Japan's early motion picture industry. So the the voices I'm considering uh, throughout this talk are those that arose and diversified amidst uh, a growing modern visual culture broadly conceived across the Meiji era in Japan, so 1868 to 1912. And more specifically, uh, the decade between the first Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, so 1894 to 1904, give or take. Um, I'll run through this quickly, um, some important dates that will sort of anchor uh, the points that I'm thinking about in terms of copyright, uh, modernization of Japan, and then eventual introduction of ocean picture technologies into Japan. Um, so 1854, 1858, you start to see uh, <clears throat> what would become known as unequal treaties imposed upon Japan by various Western powers, uh, the US first in the Treaty of uh, Kanagawa, and then uh, the Harris Treaty or the Treaty of Amity and Commerce in 1858. So these were all things that basically uh, positioned Japan um, <clears throat> and, and forced them, the Tokugawa shogunate, to, to open up ports to grant extraterritorial rights um, and various other affordances to uh, the US and then similar treaties followed uh, with other Western nations soon after. Um, in part, this sort of uh, positioning at, paired with domestic struggles led to the overthrow of the Tokugawa Shogun in 1868. Uh, imperial rule was restored through uh, the Meiji Restoration uh, and initiated the period of what, we're, what I'm thinking about the Meiji era now up until around 1912. Um, a year after the Meiji Restoration, you see uh, the first imperial publishing ordinance uh, was put forward. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I was looking at the chat there. Um, let's see, the uh, <clears throat> first publishing ordinance was put forward, uh, and this primarily protected publishers more than, uh, it was it's in the interest of publishers that were serving the aims of the nation, uh, more so than authors' rights. Um, <clears throat> and what was interesting is as uh, you start to see these sort of developments go out, you see similar uh, treaties put forward by Japan in an East Asian context, um, something like in 1876 with the Japan-Korea Treaty um, that saw similar efforts from Japan trying to establish control in Korea. Uh, by 1894, uh, 1895, we have Japanese victory in the first Sino-Japanese War. 1896-97, uh, motion picture technologies are introduced. Uh, and then a pivotal moment is 1899. This is when Meiji Japan accedes to the Berne Convention um, and used this opportunity in particular, uh, joining the, the, the Berne Convention, basically acceding to that, 
uh, is an opportunity to negotiate uh, the secession of what had been deemed these unequal treaties. And so it was a, a, a keen transnational understanding of geopolitics from Meiji Japan to position themselves uh, as this sort of rising power through manipulation of, of Western desires to, to establish these sort of international copyright norms. Uh, and then we move into 1903, you start to see the first establishment of a permanent movie theater, uh, Dinky Counter Electric Hall, uh, Tokyo. 1904, Japanese victory in the Russo Japanese War. Um, 1908, Japan ratifies the Berlin Act, the Berlin Convention. And then by 1912, uh, you start to see um, <clears throat> Japan's first sort of official film studio, Nikatsu form, and a move from primarily exhibition into one of also production and perhaps the proper uh, film industry developing as well. So this is the sort of touch points that I'm working in in this presentation today. Um, what I'm interested in thinking about is uh, this early period um, from the introduction of motion picture technologies uh, in 1896, 1997, um, <clears throat> up through the Russo-Japanese War, where you start to see a massification and interest in images and visual culture surrounding uh, Imperial Japan, both domestically and abroad. Uh, and so what we start out with here, are these images I have on screen left, uh, this is the first, the, the Tokugawa delegation that was sent to um, Washington to, to ratify the, the Harris Treaty in 1860. You can see the sort of power dynamics at play just in this early moment between um, the Japanese delegation and the US Naval officers. And then by 1899, when Japan uh, negotiates out of, Imperial Japan negotiates out of uh, these unequal treaties, you can see the visual culture around the emperor. Uh, and Japan is a sort of monolithic entity on uh, emergent power has already changed drastically. Uh, this is a postcard from 1899. And you can already see Emperor Meiji um, becoming highly visualized in a very different way. And so there's a, there's a stark contrast just across this early period and how, um, the intersections of things like uh, treaty negotiations, copyright, international copyright law, visual culture sort of coalesced um, in the formation of Japan as this, uh, this, this emergent power. Another thing that went alongside with that was the increased visualization um, <clears throat> of the, the Sino-Japanese War uh, in 1894-1895. And so I'm thinking in particular about the creation of audiences through negotiation of uh, copyright law, but also increased visualization that is circulating for domestic audiences and transnational audiences in this period. So you see something like on the left here, um, an illustration that would have circulated in a uh, British newspaper uh, <clears throat> 1895, depicting an imperial soldier walking through Kyoto. Uh, and then on the, the right, we have um, <clears throat> image of, of imperial troops in the Sino-Japanese War. And so there was a push for this sort of increased visualization um, that was coinciding with these sort of international and transnational moves that Japan, Imperial Japan was making uh, regarding things like copyright or exchange, uh, this idea of nation building that was associated with things like copyright. Uh, and by the time we get to the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, 1905, uh, we start to see what could arguably be deemed the first sort of massification of this image culture surrounding modern Japan that was facilitated through uh, previous technologies, but increasingly um, <clears throat> early motion picture technologies, so newsreels, early documentary, um, <clears throat> still frames such as this, that are showcasing this sort of imperial might uh, in this position. At the same time, though, you still have um, <clears throat> this sort of collision of, of various technologies, so the magic lantern slides or Tsushie or Gento slides, they were known at various periods. Um, that were all depicting uh, and crafting and creating this sort of image culture surrounding uh, not only Emperor Meiji at the time, that would have uh, ramifications for uh, Emperor Taisho afterwards, uh, Emperor Showa, Hirohito, um, but Japan is this, again, this sort of homogenized nation at this period um, as this emergent power, uh, Eastern power. And so you have this, this really interesting period here. Um, and I'm thinking in particular about some of the questions that were posed by the, the conference uh, and the call for papers about uh, who benefits and perhaps from you know, the absence of, of certain copyright laws or certain restrictions or um, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what, what was afforded in those sort of ambiguous periods between the sort of what we might think of as you know, copyright or censorship issues arising in sort of Japan's film industry proper after like 1912 or so. Um, 
along with the sort of domestic interest though, uh, and, and desire for these representations and, and visualizations of what was going on uh, in the Russo-Japanese War, you also see Western interest as well. Um, and so you can see um, <clears throat> some of these depictions from uh, Porter and, and Edison um, <clears throat> that came out in 1904. There's a hyper focus on Japan at this period um, that had been building through engagements um, prior to the Russo-Japanese War um, <clears throat> through uh, various reporting on things like the Sino-Japanese War, uh, signing of treaties, um, uh, Japan's involvement in the Berne Convention uh, in the previous century. And so all of these things sort of coalesce and we see this um, <clears throat> development of an image culture, a visual culture, motion picture technologies, alongside the lessons that were learned by Imperial Japan as they navigated this sort of international arena through things like um, <clears throat> copyright uh, and acceding to the Berne Convention and using those opportunities to sort of position themselves uh, globally in a way that uh, set them up to not only benefit from <clears throat> these international connections, but also in turn, uh, in many ways, uh, reassert those same sort of practices on colonial spaces such as Korea uh, leading up to uh, 1910, the annexation. Um, <clears throat> along with the, uh, the increased interest in these visual cultures, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll uh, make sure to make this brief. We have concerns of censorship that are arising at the same time though. And these are, this is a, an image I, I really like uh, from a cartoon that came out uh, Tacoma Times in 1904 that's uh, depicting you know, the world, this, this idea of Japan censoring this image. And so there's this very carefully constructed image of Japan that's being put out um, in this transnational space uh, that again, lessons that were learned from sort of that navigation and negotiation, of something like copyright law um, in 1999 that carry forward into you know, a period like the Russo-Japanese War. Um, and essentially what I think you can start to, to imagine is, is these conflicting voices in terms of audience that are, that are arising uh, in this period. So you have a Japanese populace um, that is, is increasingly interested in these sort of visual technologies, uh, imported Western technologies, this idea that's being promoted by importers that um, it is through these technologies that, you know, uh, <clears throat> civilization in some ways is being built, right? And that was part of the resistance from certain importers, Japanese importers, um, against joining uh, the Berne Convention because they were afraid that it would put limitations on translations in particular, and it would limit some of the ability to, to profit, obviously, but to circulate some of these texts. And so in some ways, you see this um, diffusion of various, uh, <clears throat> you know, visual culture object, cultural objects, motion picture technologies coming in uh, and captivating these audiences. Um, and I, what, I, what I'd like to connect this to ultimately outside of this project is this idea that um, <clears throat> looking at the sort of threat of, of copyright negotiation from Imperial Japan on an international scale uh, and the introduction and development and increased um, appeal and demand for motion picture technology is sort of coming together to create this sort of ideal, idealized version and image of uh, Emperor Meiji initially. Um, that is both circulating domestically, but also abroad, um, <clears throat> and is also serving the aims of Imperial Japan uh, as a regional power uh, in a transnational sense as it's building up its empire. Um, and the effects that that has cyclically, not just in this moment, but you know, we can trace these sort of periods um, <clears throat> of increased visualization uh, and the lessons again that were learned from navigating things like copyright law. Uh, in the late 19th century uh, into practices that carried forward um, <clears throat> in the, the total war period, in the post-war period, in the period of occupation and into the present day. Uh, and what I'll leave us with today is uh, <clears throat> something that emerged very recently. Um, and it concerns this idea of image culture being crafted through these sort of, these early, early practices that still have effects. And so this was something that came about um, very recently in the, the, the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict where Ukraine, um, one of the, the social media uh, components of the Ukrainian government had released this video. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but you, you may be familiar with this, but they had depictions of Mussolini, Hitler, and Hirohito um, <clears throat> together in this video. And there was a huge outcry uh, by many uh, Japanese government officials, uh, prominent citizens, and um, this translated here uh, from this tweet was regarding this problem video, Mr. Sato, the chairman of Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also asked the European Bureau of Ministry of Foreign Affairs to respond as soon as possible. Um, 
deemed it a completely inappropriate. Uh, and then the Ukrainian ambassador actually withdrew this. Um, they edited this video to, to take Hirohito's image away from, um, from the original video uh, and claimed it was a lack of understanding history. And so this is a bit of a stretch at this point and it takes more, there's more connective points in there. But the idea that I'd like to, to draw out from this is that we can study these earliest moments of, of Japanese, uh, <clears throat> Japanese you know, engagement with, with early motion picture technologies, the development of a visual culture, uh, visualization of the emperor and the sort of lasting effects that that has across various points in Japanese history. Um, I think I'm at time now, so I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for these rich papers. Uh, so we now have uh, time for questions. Uh, if, again, you can use the Q&A feature to ask them. I can also unmute you if you would like to ask questions. And of course, uh, panelists can ask as well. Um, maybe while we're thinking of some things to ask, I can start with a question, um, which I think runs across several of the papers. And I'm curious about this kind of process of deciding kind of what motion pictures are, like whether it's a book or a photograph or some other sort of object. And is this something that is happening really in the kind of um, relationship conversations between the kind of person taking the deposit and the one um, who's kind of depositing work? Or how does this kind of, kind of develop? Um, and I can imagine earlier examples as well. You know, is music a book or is it a pamphlet? Um, I can imagine similar kind of conversations happening. So I don't know if Zibi has maybe the first response and then we can go to others. Sure, well, it's an interesting question about conversations. I don't think, talking about it, is music a book? I really don't think the clerks in um, Philadelphia in the 1790s were having conversations about is music a book? I think it was much more, well, he gave me 50 cents, so sure. Um, or 60 cents and um, back then. And I, and I think that sort of developed a norm whereby you had a so-called rule of doubt, whereas something will be registered um, unless, um, only if there was no doubt it was wrong, it was not registrable. How that plays out in practice was a little weird, but I think they said, well, if you could doubtfully argue this is just a picture, you know, um, as opposed to something new, which does not fit, I think that was sort of the framework they were using. Certainly in, a, in, a, in early 20th century, they say, say this, this explicitly, or earlier on, they don't say it explicitly, but I think it's um, still the attitude. Great. Um, is Claudia maybe thoughts or Ian? I wanted, to, oh, hi. Oh, sorry, Ian. No, no. I, I, I was just going to say that it would be. I was, I was fascinated by, by Claudia and 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 um, Zvi all, all comment. You know, focusing on Spofford, on one man being in this interesting position of of making decisions, and also the, of course the possibility of gaps. Like, what do we not know? <laughs> Claudia mentioned about uh, what was rejected, what is missing, etc. But it was a time of novelty. And let's face it, I mean, already they would have had to deal not just with straight photographs, whatever a straight photograph is, but with stereographs. So already, even within the spectrum of still photography, there is a, you know, a growing proliferation of novel forms. I would, for instance, I've never thought of this until this moment, but I wonder what the library's response to the first stereographs was. Um, that would be interesting to look into because in a sense that's a stepping stone towards the novelty of moving pictures, animated photography. Maybe someone, maybe you guys who've been looking closely at the, um, the library uh, in, its, uh, in these crucial years have something to say about that. Mm. Yeah, I know of someone um, who did a thesis specifically on uh, the stereographs. I was actually thinking the other day, I mean, uh, Mybridge's work at the late 1880s, uh, I mean, also came in as multiple images in, in one image, right? I mean, the, the galloping horse is, is 12 images. Um, I haven't seen the particular piece of correspondence, but I had a, a two wonderful long conversations with Pat Lofney, who uh, see, says that there's a, a piece of correspondence somewhere 
between uh, Spofford and uh, Dixon or um, uh, representatives of Edison when, when the sneeze and, and works like that uh, come in uh, for one photograph would be 50 cents. So he actually sends them a bill for like 45 times uh, 50 cents. Or he was like, well, uh, please pay uh, whatever that is. 22, I'm not going to do the math. Um, and then uh, they start this conversation saying like, no, no, that's not uh, what we intend to do. This is a series of image, but it it uh, represents uh, one larger whole. So they have quite a, a formative uh, conversation. Again, I haven't seen that um, uh, that those documents and I'm still um, on the hunt uh, for it. But yeah, there's some interesting conversations uh, being had. Hmm. I, I, I'd like to jump in briefly. I don't want to um, monopolize, but um, A, Claudia makes a great point talking about fees, and we always underestimate how important fees are. So much of, of practice for corporate office was all about fee avoidance. Um, and there was a major controversy in the early 20th century about this involving co um, syndicated comics where we tried to register to avoid paying a fee for each comic by saying, oh, we made a book. And only one edition and sold it to, and, and sold it to our uh, publisher um, and therefore it's a published entity and all the cartoons are protected um, but there's all sorts of fee avoidance stuff going on throughout um, i'd say on a stereographs very briefly or much earlier it wasn't the library it was still the clerks and they they took literally anything i have found multiple examples of them taking stuff which was obviously not protected by copyright. Either it was international, which wasn't protected yet, or other things. Um, they didn't care. They just pocketed the money. And it's a sort of weird sort of weird dynamic there. And you have Spofford sort of being a little more conscientious, close to the first time someone does that. That's very interesting. Yes, absolutely. It, it kind of equates with that example I gave from, from Britain from 1897, where basically uh, the, the British Museum is concerned to protect itself from a rising tide of rubbish. <laughs> and this is the kind of phraseology that's used. The, these novelties that are being offered are considered to be um, rubbish, but they're also in danger of swamping the real artifacts, which it is the business of the British Museum to preserve. There's a, I see a parallel here between the library having to kind of regularize what is obviously not going to go away, but is going to start becoming a stream of a particular kind of artifact that's coming in. Very interesting. I think we can go to a question now from Joel Lemon. If you can see it, Zvi. Um, so first, how long would it take the whole copyright process to complete from deposit the obtaining copyright in 1902? And then a question about, uh, I imagine all of us noticed the uh, moon uh, Lubin kind of rejected copyright until 1899, but the film doesn't exist until 1902. Is this an error or is something else going on there? Okay, so how long would it take? Um, it should take less than a day. Um, although by the end of uh, Spofford's tenure, it was taking more like a couple of weeks. But in theory, it was supposed to be the same day in and out, essentially. Um, now, yeah, but yeah, there are, I, I do have some notes where he was saying near the end, I have a, I have a backlog. And you have, um, Cloudy showed some pictures of a disarray near the end there. Um, Trip to the Moon is a really interesting thing because, and Trip to the Moon is not actually, the Lubin Trip to the Moon is not the Melee Trip to the Moon. Um, it's actually the, the Philosopher's Dream, or the Astronomer's Dream. And Lubin, and Lubin I've missed, you know, mistitled it. I mean, people here, there are people here who know way more about this than I do. But so that's what it is. It's not the, it's not the trip to the moon that we know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I, I have, go ahead. I have uh, just a, a question to, to, to Lance. I was very interested in the range of, of um, material that Lance showed, particularly relating to the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, I, I've looked at that from a, a completely different angle, um, which is the, the realization in my work on Robert Paul, that um, Paul made at least three, if not four films uh, about, inspired by the Russo-Japanese War. Um, 
which was a matter of, of lively interest in Britain. Britain identified very strongly with Japan, the island nation syndrome. And as far as I can see, the tenor of these films, these are fictional reproductions of scenes from the war. They claim to be done with great authenticity of uniform, etc. <laughs> we have a few catalogue images, nothing else. But I'm just kind of interested if there, if there is a wider network. I, I just know those examples from Britain. Is there a wider network of representations of this distant war, distant for many other countries, um, which create a kind of media, you know, um, media sphere around it outside of Japan itself? Glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the, the slides I needed to cut was a uh, British Film Institute compilation of various Western, uh, French, German, uh, Belgian, um, <clears throat> all of these sort of, you know, productions that came out from this. Um, so yes, there's, there's obviously that. Um, but what I found interesting too um, is more recent scholarship um, from a Russian perspective, actually revisiting this. And so some of the actual uh, it's not necessarily from a film studies perspective, but there's overlap there, obviously. Um, there's certain Russian uh, <clears throat> films, you know, film footage that has been identified that is uh, sort of giving this very interesting look into the sort of fascination that Japan and Russia had with one another in some ways, uh, and that conflicted relationship, but also obviously the tension that was put there. Um, and so I actually, I, I wanted to include it here, but I couldn't find enough data to, to sort of verify what it was, but there is a, a some footage of, it's, it's a, from a Russian archive um, that supposedly is showing the sort of scene uh, that is interspersed with, you know, recreation, but also actual footage um, on, a, on a Russian uh, warship at the time. And so you start to see these little, it, it's, it's the, the problem of all early Japanese cinema of trying to find any content in itself. And so we ended up having these discursive studies of it. Um, but yes, that's just to say that I've encountered at least uh, various, you know, outside of British and American interest, other Western, but in particular, recently Russian sort of uh, footage that I'm still hoping to, to be able to verify more, more specifically. <laughs> Great. I was like, we can take this question now from Shiraz. Uh, so how does this grow into our digital age of restorations? Can a new restoration of a public domain title obtain a copyright? Or does it then become fair game for people to distribute openly? This is, a, again, a much discussed question. I think we have one US and one EU lawyer on the panel. So Claudia, do you want to take the take that angle first and I'll follow with US? Oh, <laughs> Claudia muted. I'm also not a lawyer, so oh, yeah. um, sure. um I think this is a conference in itself, that question. Um I think uh, there are different opinions. Um <laughs> Uh, I would say most archivists I know would say that um, a restoration would not constitute a new a new right as a so-called derivative work. Uh, there's definitely people who try, particularly through the the route of you know added music or you know um, all sorts of things. Um, there's. I don't think, I, I actually don't know if there's any cases uh, where people have tried this because that's, that's the, that's the real benchmark, right? You can, you can um, do all sorts of things, but then um, does it hold up uh, under court? I think the, the closest thing we might have is the colorization debate of the, the late eighties, early nineties, where if you added at least three colors, you would, at least in this country, but Svi, uh, please add uh, to this, um, you could then um, extend a film's copyright with, with 75 years. Um, my personal opinion is if the underlying work is in the, in, uh, the public domain and you make a restoration, um, it should probably not uh, attract a new right, but, um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'll just jump. So, so, so Clyde is absolutely right to point to colorization, where of course we actually had a legislative compromise and said, listen, and the Library of Congress said, if you sent us pristine black and white copies of new ones, then absolutely, please, you know, you're, you're colorized crap can have, can have some protection, sure. 
I'm paraphrasing. Um, there is a, a major ca a case that we always point to in copyright law, the Hand of God case, where uh, federal, a federal trial court in New York found that a restoration of Rodin's Hand of God was protectable by copyright. That's been eaten around. I think a lot of people are skeptical of that holding. Um, if you look at the compendium of corporate office um, uh, practices, which is a US corporate office publication that sets out their general practices for registration, they indicate that simply cleaning something up is not enough. In particular, for a sound recording, I know they say just a straight transfer from analog to digital does not give you anything new. You have to do more than just ride the, just ride the uh, balances. You have to, a remix might be, might be protected, but just a straight transfer is not probably. Um, I will say on the flip side, I do believe most studios claim copyright in every single, and new copyright in all digital transfers. And how good that claim is varies. It's at least a colorable claim, so you'd have to litigate it. I'll drop a link to the Hand of God case in the chat. It, we have to re remember, if I could just jump in there, we have to remember that there's a real lack of case law in many of these areas. Uh, I, I was uh, a member of the, um, the British government's uh, IPO um, uh, advisory committee for five years, all because I put my head up above the parapet and uh, all the officers were there and they said, come on, join the, com <laughs> join the committee. And I spent five years sitting in this committee watching mainly the maneuvers of the music industry, which was heavily represented on the committee and was right up there with its, you know, all its legal guns firing. So the music industry is way ahead in terms of claiming rights, defending rights, extending rights, etc. There was nobody else speaking for film at all on this particular committee, which is why they invited me to, to, to join it. But the officers of the Intellectual Property Office in Britain were enraged, constantly enraged by people not understanding the provisions for fair dealing within the British copyright law, which is also the EU law at that time. In other words, they would say people are constantly asking permission for things which they don't need to ask permission for. And that is why I made reference to what I call the IP industry, which has encouraged many people to believe that A, that they have the right to demand permission, to, to, to withhold permission, and encourage many other people to believe that they have to ask permission. The truth is that under current copyright law, at least in Britain, which hasn't diverged much from Europe yet, um, there's a large provision for uh, fair use. And um, people don't know that, and they're not encouraged to use it. <laughs> and that's a pity because if it's not used, it withers and practices grow up which encourage people to ask for totally unnecessary permissions to do straightforward things. I mean, that is one of the, the real pressing issues of the moment. And I think it, it feeds into what we're talking about here, this whole question of can you create new rights through restoration, through discovery, through et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have to be on our guard against that. Otherwise the past will become increasingly lost to us because it'll be locked up. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have other questions in the audience? I guess maybe one question we can think about is, um, touching on several is, do we see this as um, a kind of story of divergence in terms of these different copyright traditions, or is it more one of convergence in which copyright looks more similar now than it did a century ago or more. Well, I, I would say it's essentially convergence uh, and, and it's, it's organizations like uh, WIPO, obviously that are encouraging convergence. I mean, from a global corporation's point of view, the more convergence you can have, the better. Uh, the major outlier, I have to say, uh, is the French and I, I, I began looking recently into a question which had never occurred to me, which is that, of course, we, we in Britain and perhaps in America think of France as being exceptional, but actually there are many other jurisdictions that are shaped by the, the Napoleonic Civil Code, like all of Latin America. <laughs> uh, 
uh, for instance, which maybe we don't think about so much. So actually, it, it's a whole network of jurisdictions which are shaped by this very different legal tradition. It doesn't often surface as an issue, but certainly I, I looked recently at uh, the, the syllabus for a four day French seminar on um, droit moral, droit d'auteur, and to look at the headings that the members, people attending this were being taken through, the, the, the subheadings of droit moral are absolutely extraordinary to Anglo-Saxon eyes. It's a whole different world of protection, protection for of the rights, and, and this goes back into the wider theme of the conference, protection of the rights of individuals of all kinds and their descendants, which is very alien to the common law tradition uh, of, of both Britain and America and other common law jurisdictions. Well, Ian, it's interesting you mentioned that because I've always, we're sort of two different, at the time, we're time there a lot of us are talking about, you know, the America was really the outlier. And you really saw a convergence going on with everyone else. And I've always thought of Bern, which was brand new when all this was going on, was really the British sort of surrendering to the French. And <laughs> not, not something you hear often, but really the, the, the British and the French had, I mean, there were other nations involved, but those were the two major cultural and the British had very few of copyright, and ultimately the French said, listen, we're, we're not going to budge. And the British said, okay, then we'll budge. Um, and yep. that really underpins Bern. Um, yep. Yep. And I think, as you say, as time has gone on, the US, and I think Britain's always had an equivocal relationship with its with that surrender, um, I, I, I think to a degree. Um, and Britain has sort of swung, I think, a little between those, those poles. Um, where America sort of set up this sort of fair use structure of copyright regime. And France has always been broad daughter and you know very broad authorial rights, um, which frankly are a very awkward fit for modern film. They fit perhaps better, I mean, a hundred years ago. Um, but if you try, I mean, honestly, you know, the film industry loves copyright, but I think they have an awkward relationship with, with, I mean, in fact, I'll go further. That's why the U.S. does not have moral rights in any real way as a film industry. Yeah. And so it's a very complicated dance fair. Yes. Sure is. Can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> with increasing numbers of people making very healthy livings out of uh, working on that can of worms, I have to say, the army of IP lawyers. <laughs> I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> well, terrific. Um, so I think we'll close now. And again, we'll return at uh, the hour, so 20 minutes from now, uh, for panel two, which will be chaired by Tammy Williams. And so I will see you in a bit. It's 12 o'clock. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. Um, uh, we are, uh, you're here for our second panel, uh, Preservation and Identification. Um, I am uh, pleased to uh, introduce our panelists, but I just want to say that our, uh, we have slightly changed the order of our panel and we'll be starting with David Pierce from the Library of Congress and then Alexis 